So multiple representations is recognizing that um, one modality, in this case, may not be enough, and that things can be sometimes done much more clearly in um, different representations, but often in um, multiple ones. And we can make things, uh, <coughs> let me get back to where I am. So I want to do the same thing with what about reading. Um, how do we think about multiple representations uh, when we're reading? And they're going to be the same. Is that music? Somebody went on. Oh, somebody's on. OK, now no fair watching great videos while I'm talking. Quiet. <laughs> um, uh, so yesterday, we talked about um, when we look at the brain stuff, we see that there are many components in reading. Um, sometimes we think there's only two, uh, which typically is done like this. There's something about comprehending language and something about word recognition. Word recognition is the stuff of decoding and so on. And uh, is that coming from me or somebody else? <laughs> Yeah, audience participation. Yeah. Uh, and here's, look at all of these elements in what's called the simple model of reading. You can see that, oh my god, these are all things that in fact go into the process of reading in the simplest model anyone could think of. And that students differ, as we said yesterday, in any of these. You can come in just, you don't have the vocabulary, you have everything else. You can come in, you just don't have the decoding, you have everything else. But you will have difficulty um, comprehending, um, making sense of what you're reading. And this is just to show in the brain, we, when you're reading actually, use almost all your brain. It's amazing how much of your brain you got to use to, to read with. And so these are parts of your front of your brain are like using it, all these parts are. And actually new studies show that we're using these parts when we read too. It's unbelievable how many parts, because there's so many things to do when we read. Um, and here's more, but some people, so now I'll make the choice. Some people said, not too much brain stuff. So later you can look at these slides, brain stuff. Um, but anyway, a lot of parts to reading. The reading, the reason it's good to look at the brain stuff is it shows you that all of these dots show parts of the brain that are involved in reading, reading single words. So it is a huge committee. Yesterday I talked about a f forming a committee in your brain. So the committee that reads is gigantic. It's like 60 different members that need to go together so that you can read. Um, and uh, we tend to oversimplify and think, well, they're sort of decoding and uh, reading comprehension strategies. Um, so how do we create a reading environment where everybody has equal access to get um, to, uh, to the meaning we want. We want kids down here comprehending. And uh, what's that mean we should do? I, I've never done this before, so we'll see if this bombs or not. <laughs> but I realized that I want to play through the metaphor we talked about yesterday, which is to say, we tend to focus on the kids and say they have disabilities. But what I really want to do today is talk about if you're reading from print, we're going to be reading in any case, but if you're reading from print, what are print's abilities, and you could say slash disabilities? So let me say when you look at a classroom of students, you're going to find students that are highly varied in their visual abilities and in their hearing abilities, just natural. And this is the first part of those three things, perception. So kids are different. So this is kind of dumb here. It'll get, I hope, a little bit more interesting. But what are Prince disabilities when it faces the fact that the students are really variable? So what is, what's a disability of print to, to be able to work well when we have students that are really very variable? So can someone think of a disability? Yeah. Yes, it's not able to conform itself to these differences. Well, give me a concrete example. What's one example of a way that it can't 
um, it, it can't provide the options I need. What? If someone is an auditory learner and it cannot become that. OK. It's, it, it can't talk. It can't do anything orally. So it's got to be visual only. It's only got one way of communicating, visual, period. OK, so that's a problem. What's another problem it has for these, just these kinds of things? What's another? Size. What's that? One size. Great. It's only for acuity of a, a, a very narrow range of visual acuity. If you got, oh, you're wearing glasses, so you, you know the problem. Uh, so you have to wear glasses because you can't adjust the font size, OK? Because it's in print, it's one size, and it goes, hey, in the old days, before we had glasses, it was like a whole lot of people couldn't read only because the print was in one size. Yeah? Um, yeah. And a certain font is an A and another font. Great. There's a whole visual recognition thing that goes about the letters themselves being recognized across whatever this uh, font is and all that. Great. Um, and I can't change it. I can't change the font to a simpler font to a better font. It's fixed. Good. Any others? Yeah. Contrast. Great. It can't change the contrast. Um, for some people, black on white is really clear. For some people, it's not really clear. We can't change it. It's fixed. So you've got to say, OK, well, that's tough for you. Any others people want to? There's be quite a few we can go. Uh, <laughs> amplify that. Good. It requires that you track. It's interesting. Almost nobody ever says that. But <laughs> We've had students for whom the, the major problem in reading is that they visually can't track the letters left to right. And if you, in a digital environment, we can guide them by just having the highlighting work. But anyway, can't do that. OK. So print, I want you to start thinking that print is disabled in these ways. You can't, it can't change its font. It can't talk aloud. It can't do all of these things. It can't change its contrast. It's very disabled in how it can um, interact with kids who we know from the beginning are variable. And that's the key of UDL, is saying, we know that kids are going to vary this way. And print can't do it. So print is disabled in those ways. Now I want to shift to language and symbols, second of the three things. What are, this is what the kids, this is only some of them. Kids are going to vary in their vocabulary. And I think, I don't know if these studies have, are, are current for you. But do you know these, these wonderful stud, Todd and Risley studies that show the gigantic vocabulary difference between, uh, some of you are nodding, so you know this work. It's unbelievable. If you, if you remember the numbers, tell me. But the difference in vocabulary be between underprivileged kids and kids from the suburban high-end schools on school entry is not like double. It's like huge. Some kids come in with 80,000 word vocabularies, and some kids come in with the equivalent of like 700 word vocabularies. Just incredible differences if you really study it. And I know that happens in Canada as well. Um, so kids come in with very different vocabularies. They come in with very different syntactic abilities. They come in with very different languages they speak at home. They come in with um, highly varied decoding skills. Some are really fabulous decoders, and some are not. And Actually, I, I just want to emphasize, because it's, it's important. When we say varied decoding, actually, most kids in school are not as good decoders as some kids with disabilities. Who is a, who's a kid that we call disabled that is actually usually a gifted decoder? What's, what's, I don't know how much, yeah, way in the back. A student with high functioning, a medical diagnosis of high functioning autism. Great. Kids with high functioning autism, Asperger's. Um, the very first kid I saw as a clinician, as a clinical neuropsychologist, was a kid who was the, won the spelling bee in Boston in the second and third grade. He was the best speller in Boston. Really knows decoding. And he was Asperger's, very high functioning autism. Now, he had trouble with the next slide, but right now, he's a gifted. In fact, they thought maybe I should put him in a gifted program because he was a fabulous decoder. So kids are highly varied, and uh, our print material, well, oh, let's, anyway, so let's go. What are print's abilities? What are the disabilities of print in 
accommodating this wide range of students' abilities. With, so what, what's a disability um, that print has in, in matching this? Is this all too obvious? I just, am I beating a dead horse? But let me, just humor me for another minute. What's, yes, I see your hand there. Okay, good. It doesn't have any option for if the kid doesn't have the vocabulary, the kid can't imagine what that word means. It doesn't have anything to do. It just is like, oh my God, you're in trouble. Okay? So it's quite disabled in what to do about a kid who doesn't have the vocabulary. And that difference, again, is 10 times. Some kids have that 10 times the amount of vocabulary that another does. And print doesn't have any way to deal with that. Print says, some of you are going to do bad. Okay? Um, uh, what's some uh, other things? What's some other disabilities print has? Say it again. Most things that we get in our schools are in English. Total English. Only speaks print, almost always only gives one language. And I know you probably have, that's actually a good question. How many of your textbooks are bilingual actually? I mean, this, this is one country where they should be. Are they all bilingual? No, <laughs> they're not even all bilingual. Okay. So what about kids who speak Arabic and whatever? So in, uh, you probably know this, and oh, I'll show it to you later. But Google Translate will translate in, into 40 languages on the fly. It's amazing. Question? So uh, in the old days, I'm that old, uh, when I didn't understand a word, I picked up a dictionary. Yeah. And that was a different learning experience yeah. that helped me to form and bring concepts right. together. So how does that play into your conversation? It's great, great instance actually, because the dictionary is really actually a terrible tool for that. Because, and you, I see you're nodding, because in fact, the, the skills of using the dictionary are harder than the word that you were looking up usually. So <laughs> kids who have vocabulary problems never, I, I've said this uh, publicly, I've never seen a natural occurrence of a youngster looking a word up in a dictionary <laughs> as a matter of uh, just that I would do it. They do it only in school settings where teachers make them. Because if it's hard, if vocabulary is your liability, dictionaries are not built for you. <laughs> They're incredibly hard to use. Um, then you usually get, as you, I'm sure you're nodding because it's the same, you get four definitions and you go, well, what, what one is it? Well, the great thing about, and so books are like that. They say, okay, we're not very good at vocabulary. Go use something that's harder. <laughs> This is crazy, okay? So what can we do in a digital version? We can say, click on that word and tell me the right word in context. Don't give me a whole lot of definitions. What is that word right there mean, okay? So that, so right, it's very disabled in helping anybody with vocabulary problems. What's some other uh, disabilities that print has? Anybody else? Uh, any of these? Uh, well, maybe what I'll do is show, uh, all right, I am starting to worry. Okay, I want to show you a digital version that has more support built into it. Um, but let me say, let me go to comprehension. People come in with highly different, everybody comes in with very different background knowledge to any topic. Kids come in with don't knowing, uh, do or not knowing critical features. These are the things that are on your sheets. Um, kids have, some kids have lots of strategies for uh, making meaning out of text. Some kids don't have any strategies. And some kids have huge, um, comparatively, huge short-term memory, have great capacity to remember things. Other kids do not. What does print do? I, I think you're getting the idea that actually print doesn't, can't do anything about those. Print uh, doesn't have any way of giving you the background you need when you need it. Um, doesn't, can't highlight the critical features for you like I did with the music, etc. So let's look at a, um, Let's look at a, uh, a different uh, digital kind of book that's got some uh, more universal design built into it.